And we are live. Welcome back to Inside the Labyrinth Podcast, Season 6, Episode 1. Uh, super excited for today, as you guys can see. We are live in person. Four great guys about to have a great conversation. And I'm going to kick it over to, and you guys know where to find me, at reps underscore four underscore responders. I'm going to kick it over to the one and only, the real Jumpman Jay. All right. Um, happy to be here right now um, with... Uh with uh with with Frank and um we got two great guests today. Um uh, we've obviously interviewed Ralph before and if you're not familiar with Ralph Friedman, um probably New York City's most legendary police officer. We had the privilege of sitting down and talking with him. And uh it was just amazing to kind of be in front of a, a legend. I used to hear stories about this guy when I was in the city and um to actually have a conversation and sit down with him. Um really kind of brought some things to light and uh it was a great conversation i took a lot from it and um ralph was uh, great enough to uh bring a friend with him today so i'll spin it over to ralph and ralph is gonna uh, introduce himself and his guest how you doing uh happy to be here thanks for doing another podcast with me um first i want to mention i have a book out street warrior um with my co-author pat peccarelli and uh, I also have a TV series, Street Justice, The Bronx. Yes, yes. They're both available on Amazon.com, uh, the show's on Apple, and on demand. Uh, I have my friend here I want to introduce, Pete Thron, who was a very active, decorated police officer with the NYPD housing. And uh, Pete has a very interesting story. Uh, he's the author of two books. His first book was... End of Tour, which uh, describes his uh, career and how it ended, hence the name, End of Tour. Pete got a, a raw deal from the city and from the department, uh, and he wound up going to jail, state prison, for two years, which he wrote another book, One Under, which describes his entire stay in the prison system, his uh, mental capacity there, and his strength that got him through it and how he wound up in having to deal with the prisoners uh, that he arrested himself and had to do time with. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Pete now, or back to Jay, uh, either one, and they're going to tell you a little more about his career. All right. So, uh, so Pete, I'm going to kind of just jump right into it. So um, what? Uh, let's just talk about, like, your childhood. Um, you know, where'd you grow up um, and, uh, you know, where you went to school, and um, we'll, we'll go from there. I grew up on Long Island, and um, I was a above-average ball player, and got a scholarship for baseball. Okay. And I actually had a walk-on with uh, the Mariners when they were an extension team. Awesome. And I was going to get signed for. I had a pre-signing contract with a um, for twenty-five thousand dollar signing bonus. Okay. But I was in a, I was in college, and we were in the middle of a tournament. And my coach, I had no agent, so my coach was going to be my agent because I had no idea what the contract was. It's just like what the hell? This had got a lot of legal things here. Yeah. So I ended up going back to uh, Long Island, playing in the tournament, and we made it into champ into the championship game. And I ended up running into a fence and screwing up my throwing arm and I lost the contract and ended up going to my next career which was uh, NYPD, the housing. So uh, what year was that when you got into uh, NYPD? Uh, 1983, 87. 87? Yeah. What year were you born? 82. <laughs> <laughs> so you were playing outfield at that time? Yeah, I was a left fielder. So in your, in your mind you're going basically it was just MLB. That was your goal at the time. That's you know that's where I was hoping to go, and so what made you take the test? I took the test right after that, and being that I was hurt, I started training, and I was well, I was on the job at 22 years old. That's the same age when I got on. Any family on the job? No, I was the first one. First so one. same as me. Wow. Oh, and I, my my, yeah. my my ex-wife, she was on the job. I met her in the academy. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, all right, you get into the academy. What was your mindset? I mean, uh, coming from like that athletic background, um, you jumping right into police work. Uh, like what was your mindset? Cause 22 is pretty young, right? Cause I, I just remember myself being a 22 year old kid. I didn't know, 
you know, anything other than like sports and, and like my neighborhood, like where I grew up. So I had to kind of change my mindset a little bit when I got into the academy. With the academy, I just, I kind of, I wanted to be a cop if I didn't become a ball player. Okay. Watching all the movies like The Seven Ups and French Connection. Yeah. My brother would take me to all these movies and I'm like, you know what, that's what I want to do. I want to be, want to be those guys. And here I am next to Ralph and he worked with these guys. Yeah. And it's, it's such a privilege and it's an honor, you know. It, and then after the academy, I just started getting this drive to be, I, I became obsessed with becoming a detective. And that obsession led to my downfall. Yeah, mm. that was one of my career goals, uh, was to become a detective at some point. Um, so, when, so when you got out of the academy, uh, what, what housing bureau did you go to? I went to uh, PSA 5. PSA 5, okay. Art, uh, Spanish Harlem. Did two months there, but I was trained by this, I can't say his name, but he, he was a Vietnam veteran, big, big dude, and he just took my Long Island thoughts, threw them out the window. He yeah. said, first thing he said, he said, whatever you learned in the academy, throw it out the fucking window. Yeah. Throw it out. Yeah, throw it out, yeah. There's, you're, in, you're in the belly of the beast. And I just learned from him. He wasn't too much into narcotic collars, but I, I, I got that bug. And then I went down to Pressure Point, and then I ended up going to uh, PC6. PC6, okay. And that's uh, where I did a lot of my time there. Okay, uh, let's talk about the climate of New York at that time. So like the 80s, uh, I mean, I was a child. Well, you were coming into the uh, crack era, yes. which was right after I left. Yes. I didn't deal with that. Because I retired, I got hurt in August of 83. Okay. And they carried me on the books. I was in the hospital and stuff. My official retirement date was January 84. When were you retired? 34. 34? Yeah, crack, what, crack what was crack when you write when you retired? Crack was not really a it, thing yet? or No, it wasn't a thing. It really came out about a year later. Crack was really around 80, the end of 84, 85, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And that really, Destiny that was a whole, uh, yep. whole other ball game for the... Uh, now, the what, streets and the police. What what injury like uh, brought you to well, say at thirty four years old? Yeah, I I'm just done. got back from. Uh, I was always riding a motorcycle. I was always into Harley's, and I, the police department told me how to ride when I was in the academy. So I always had a bike off duty, and then I um, I just got back from uh, Virginia Beach, so okay. I was still vibrating. And my partner Timmy Kennedy, I let him drive. He I did most of the driving, but that day I said you drive because I was still vibrating. And uh, I still tease him. We're still good friends today. Mm -hmm. I always tease him. He's one of the best cops I ever worked with. Yeah. Definitely my best detective partner. But I said he still can't drive. You know. <laughs> you know. So he he was driving, and we don't know if it was his fault or not. But we were going to a ten thirteen mm -hmm. where a cop was calling for assistance. Yeah. And it was a real thirteen because sometimes you get yeah, fake ones called in by civilians. They just want to uh, see police cars race or get a cop hurt. Or they're going to pull a crime on one end, they can get cops to the other end, whatever. But this was a real 13 cop calling for assistance. He was calling directly. So we were racing there, and we were in an unmark, and we were driving west on 200th Street, Bedford Park, okay. going, we were going to get down to Jerome Avenue, we were going to make a left to go south, mm -hmm. because it was coming from 183rd Street. And a radio car driven by a rookie with a female uh, officer in the car was driving south on uh, Jerome Avenue. Okay. So before we could make the turn at Jerome and Bedford, they T-boned me. Ooh. Never They had the light and siren on, never touched the brakes. There was zero rubber. And in those years, Highway Patrol needed 30 feet of rubber to determine how fast the car was going. Yeah. But they just straight T-boned me, probably about 75 miles an hour in my hip. And I shattered my right hip, uh, broke 23 bones, broke my pelvic left, right, upper and lower, and shattered my right hip. Ooh. So. Yeah. Uh, that's not even counting the stuff I caught in the hospital, like phlebitis, pneumonia, bed sores, streptococcus, blood disease, all these things I caught over the months in the hospital. Sure. But that's what retired me. I wasn't able to run anymore. And it took me a couple of years to get better. Wow. But that was like right before the crack ap epidemic. Okay. And, uh, you know, Pete came on at that time in uh, like 87, he said. Exactly. And uh, that was when it was in full, full, full swing, blow, yeah, you know, yeah. the... Uh, Rock and rolling, big rock time. and roll, it was death and violence, even a lot more. Yeah. So, Pete, did you have, when you got out, was there, an F, was there any FTOs there, or was it yes. more? 
here's a map and would they have impact? Like, no, impact I went, with, I went no? with a an FTO. They, we had three, and this the one guy he. We, we became very close, and he said, I'll take him. He, he ended up doing a lot of my training. There was a woman that trained me for a little while, and another guy. No, the other guy, he kind of showed me the memo, he, like the uh, patrol guide. You know, you want to do this so you don't get in trouble. I, I, did, I got most of my, my training from the, uh, the big guy. That, you guys had an RMP or always on foot? I was always on foot. And we, when I was with the big guy, I was, always took the stairs. My first day out, I, what they call it, vertical patrol. vertical patrols. Yeah, now that interior, patrol. like interior situation. Yeah, changed, my so. first day out, he's first building I ever went into. He says, "All right, listen, kid. First, before you go in, always look up. You got to look out for airmail." Airmail, yeah. So okay. that, that was always a thing. Still is today. Yeah. So we're walking up and we do the thing, and he started telling me about some of his, his things that he did on on the roof, and we uh, go downstairs. And he lets me go first. I didn't look up. Okay, I threw a cinder block at me Ooh. from like 13 stories down. It literally landed about six or eight feet away from me. I dove out of the way, came up with my gun. I'm like, fuck, <laughs> you know, yeah. who's shooting at me? Yeah. And he's like, oh, see your weapon. I'm like, holy shit, what the fuck? You know? yeah. So I, I put my gun in, he picks me up, and we walk back onto the... Uh, the trestle, whatever it was, and he's like, so what'd you learn? I'm like, always look up, Sax. Always, always look up. <laughs> i tell you a funny story about air mail. I was, uh, we were at a scene, and we get getting air mail, and I'm just getting into the car. There's a Plymouth, unmarked, right? And I, I got the door open, you know, where you're just sliding your ass into the seat, and a five-gallon bucket of shit oh came down God. and split on the roof and the door of the car. Nailed you, right? Oh, my God, I was covered in shit. <laughs> I drove the car straight to my house because I lived at the time. I was working in the 5-2, and I didn't live far away. So, But I was in Westchester, just over the line. So I drove there, and I get, I get my super was there, and he was a good guy. I was friends with him, right? And he hosed out the car, right? Well, I went upstairs, and I, my apartment, I lived in the, in the building, right next door to my apartment, my apartment door was the incinerator chute or the compact. Everything it was went. an incinerator convert. I don't know what time it was then. Yeah. But I totally got under. I took my gun belt off, my guns and my stuff. I was in on plain clothes. Took my guns off and stuff, put it on my, by my door. But I didn't want to go in my apartment. I got totally undressed in the hallway. Mm-hmm. And I'm naked in my neighborhood. Birthday suit, out. Ralph. And I'm throwing, <laughs> Birthday it, suit, throwing Ralph. everything in, I, I own in the garbage chute. Oh my I remember that in, that, in, that, in, the doc, in the Amazon Prime, the girl was walking by, and like, hello. And she was looking at you, yeah. That's funny. Was that, was your per, that was your personal car? No, it was a depo- I did use my, my right. personal car and my motorcycle. was authorized my whole time on the job. Yeah, but that was, I was using a, a city car at that time. Thank God. Yeah. But we hosed it out, and my super cleaned it for me. Thank God I never had with any shit. You know, so, that would have been real embarrassing. Not yet for both of us. So if you can always look out. A knife or a gunshot wound. But to say line of duty death by like bucket of shit bucket was of very shit, embarrassing. Yeah, it was super embarrassing. Yeah. Super embarrassing. Um, you know? I got an airmail story, but then as eventful as that, <laughs> um, I was getting out of Richmond Plaza, and uh, they threw a microwave up from about 20, 20 stories up. A microwave just lands right by my foot. I literally stepped out of the you know the vans like the impact vans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I stepped out, and the microwave just lands sounded like a fucking bomb landing. Boom. See, this is something that is there any food in there? don't understand. People don't understand that. They don't even put that stuff in the news. No, never. They just say, oh, some bottles were thrown, but they don't know. And that'll kill you. Any air mail hits you directly in the head. Oh, you're, you're done. done. You're done. You know, and this is something police all over, well, I wouldn't say not all over, but major cities. Major cities. Yeah. Anywhere in these buildings, all police right. officers face that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Something that the public it doesn't have an idea about. That'll kill you just as fast as a gunshot. And a lot of the time with the air mail, it's hard to find out where it exactly came from exactly. and could go up there and call like, no, right after that happened. Was... After that happened, did you continue the vertical? No, we got out of it. Yeah. He's just like, I, he just wanted to make sure I learned something. It's crazy. He's happy that I didn't yeah, get it. You always learn on this job. Yeah. 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 But that was like my first 30 minutes on the job. Driving home, well, I was like, what? Well, police work is an evolving learning experience. Yeah, yeah you always learn it. You always, always learn it. That's one of the best things about this job. Uh, is I got 16 years on. That's what makes it an adventure, not a job. 
Mm-hmm. You know? so, like so, so back to the so the eighties, you're working housing. So now you're starting to pick up your activity, right? So uh, you know, your boss is making note of this. Did you get in any kind of like specialized units? Um, well, I was usually the leader leading a officer for arrest every month. I was making between fifteen to twenty five arrests every month. It's an active guy. And it's impact numbers, bro. What they they Sorry, didn't solo? Or you had a group of guys. No, no, no. This this was solo. My partner and I were doing it. My partner really didn't. He was more of a, he wanted to go into police academy, but he he kind of wanted to run the show. But I was like, no, this is what we're doing. We're going. We're going to make collars. Yeah. So between you two, fifteen to twenty-five a month. No, just that. Those were just my numbers. Him, he he probably made it like another ten. <laughs> and okay, he was an active guy. They the, the bosses. They were old school. They were used to locking guys up for walking on the grass. You would you would get it in the housing authority. You would get a ticket if you walked on the grass back in the fifties and sixties. So they were locking guys up for that. They weren't used to a cop that was going across the street, stopping the drugs from coming in to the project. And the, there were a few good bosses that understood it, but they're like, "Listen, you got to make some calls and." The in the buildings, so I ended up, uh, about a year or two later, I ended up going after a uh, guy from the Bronx. He, he, they teamed up with um, the Purple City Gang okay. on 122nd Street. I had run-ins with them for almost two years. I was constantly locking those guys up. Yeah. And I ended up going up after him, and I never got the main guy. But I made. I, I just wanted to get some collars in the, in the projects just to keep them off my back, mm-hmm. so I could keep doing what I was doing in the yeah. street. And the Purple City Gang, they they, they followed me home once. Yeah. And you were they, living in Long Island. I was in I was in Queens, and I didn't know they followed me home. I went to, to court the next day, and my brother lived in the building I lived in, so I'm opening up my door, and it's locked from the inside. I'm like, fuck. I kick the door in, and there's a purple vial there on the oh, floor. Oh, shit. Same. And we're watching you trying to type the, of deal, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They wouldn't stay away. And I was just like, okay, this is... They took a forty-five automatic out of there, 3000 in cash, jewelry, flipped everything off. They destroyed my apartment. But I took a hit for five days for losing the gun. Losing the gun. I was going to ask if you took a hit for the gun. Yeah. Oh, it's... Oh, my God. So, I mean, what came of that? So You, you took the hit, right? They stole my car the next day because they took, they took an extra pair of keys oh, and they stole shit. it in front of the freaking precinct. Wow. I'm like, holy crap, how much, how bad is this going to get? You got to go into your mindset right there. What's Pete thinking there? Are you saying... I, I, I was just like, okay, now everybody's going. Yeah. Anybody on the street... Everybody is going, and I just I, I basically wage war against them, and the end I ended up getting into a massive fight when I we would I was doing plain clothes, and I arrested a, a dealer that was a big big guy, and I was in pretty good shape, but this guy, I arrested him and he picked me up, ran me out the door, right through the front on the street, so on top of me. And this guy's holding a pit bull like it had to be 150 pounds. Oh, no. Muscle, collar, and I'm like, fuck. So I flip, I did a wrestling move, I flipped him over to the side. Mm-hmm. And I kicked him because the guy let the dog go. Oh. Gave the dog a command to, to, to attack me. So I kicked the guy in front of him. And the dog starts ripping him apart. Yeah, so the guy gives him an order, stop, and start coming at me. I pump four rounds into the, the dog. This close. Every time a round would hit him, he'd jump up and come back at me. Had one round left. And another cop from, that I was working with came back from me, uh, behind me, put his gun over my shoulder, shot the dog behind the ear. The dog was still alive. So now every, now they're, th- they're hurling stuff at us. We locked the guy up for with the, with the uh, dog. I lock up the uh, dealer. And we're getting plastered with bricks bottles and the dog is still whimpering in pain and someone my nickname on the street was batman okay so somebody yelled that that was 
that's some cruel shit, man. man. I said, you want to see cruel shit? I took the gun and I put the, do I, I, I put the dog down. I put the gun right in the dog's eye and I shot him. I didn't want to. But the dog, it, the dog was went, it, he, he was just suffering. Yeah. But I was in so inferior that the guy said, I said, now you can get all, all you guys get off the street. And after that, it was just, it was on. Any Anytime I went out on the street, I didn't, I didn't even go to other places. I went right to 122nd Street to lock as many guys up as I could. Shit. And what was, the, what, was your, what was the morale in your command like? Did they back you up or they're like, Pete, you're on your own? That's the important, that's yeah, an important question. In, I, in I my really experience, got so when there's like, a, like one real active guy. You're on, you're on your own. You're on yeah. your own. You're on your own. There Just from was, what I understand. There were about 10 cops that were like me, but... How many, that, how many cops in the command would you say? There, there were about 120 okay. cops. I was a PBA delegate for them. Oh, because I was getting so much, I was in so much trouble. I was down at CCRB all the time. Yeah. Well, so the, you're an active guy. The PBA active. president well. goes, all right, listen, I'm just making you a PBA delegate because you know all the, all the rules and all the laws. So right, you've been through it. You've been you're through everything. Here. You're, you're going to be a, a rep. So I was a rep for everybody. But I'd say the other 110 cops, they were, they were, they were nice to me, but it was a very political command. See, I, I found the 4 1. When I was in the 4 1 yeah. anti crime, I found it to be different than that. I was going to ask you. You were really tight. If one guy had a problem, the, the, whoever he had a problem with had a problem with like, all Even if of patrol us. calls in 85, you're still uh, going to be there in, well, a, right, in a second. In a second. You know, I, we were very tight. You know, I actually started uh, probably 17 years before Pete, more or more. But the guys were very tight. You know, we. Uh, we stuck together with that. You know, if somebody had a problem, we were all on it. I feel like the job. And I felt it was very a lot of camaraderie. Even when I went up to the five two squad and got into the detective bureau, the guys were tight those in those years. The and like I said, it was all prior to eighty four. Yeah. And I started as a trainee back in sixty eight, but I found it to be very very tight. That's the Bronx for you. Yeah, that's also, yeah. But I think it was the, the whole job back the job in that, a whole back in those in years, era, yeah. that era. Yeah. So just from that 15-year difference. Remember when we came on, changing. when we came on, we were still working with guys from the 50s and 60s, yeah. right? You know what I mean? <laughs> so you gotta think about you that know, mindset, so it's not only, yeah. it's not only, that's the mindset that we were taught. We were been, been broken in by these old But even if, are you saying that the, the, the housing guys making the rest for someone walking on the grass? I think that's kind of a little... That's a joke. That's, that's, like a, that's, that's, that's I know. Thing, well, that's a, equivalent to jaywalking. I yeah. Guess. Right. Yeah. You know, to, they, what he was probably they're trying to bring out that it, it was a tight control, try to keep things tight. Where today it's so loose. Yeah. Right. And then they were actually the cops used to. Back in those days, they had to go up to the apartments, and they would check the apartments to make sure they were clean. And if they weren't, they would issue a warning. Oh. Really? You get, you get three warnings, get you're out. Today. You get three warnings, you're out. So when, so when uh, if the, one of their kids got locked up, that's another warning. So the parents took care of it right there. Really? They made sure. So when, why, when did that disappear? It disappeared probably in the serious. 70s and 80s. Early 80s, I think it, it disappeared. Yeah, I, would, and, I would say that too. And then when crack came in, it was just... Every man for himself, it, it, it was just, a mayhem. I don't think uh, I mean it was a, Gotham City. Yeah, uh, it was a, a it lot was, of people don't understand like what crack did to the it deteriorated city. the city. Yeah, I mean what it did to the country. Mm -hmm. um, it, it In decimated. today's world, it's equivalent to like maybe fentanyl. Yeah, yeah. Right now, it's but fentanyl I feel like now. Mm -hmm. It was um, it was different because uh, a lot of a lot of guys were were as far as like street guys, right? Guys were getting involved in this stuff, and there was a lot of commerce, right? So these guys were dealing these drugs, right? And then creating these like little side hustles. You see like these dry cleaners and all these things popping up and they would have fronts. You know, some guys would try to clean the money. There's a lot of commerce came from that. But in on the back end of that, it destroyed whole communities. It affected yeah. families yeah. for like generations. It just, you know, it started yeah, in There 80. was a thing Absolutely. with uh, crack babies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's That's what, I was gonna go right addicted. into that, yeah. So it, it, it started in the 80s, but it also trickled over into like the, you know, the, the right. 90s and the 2000s, you started, to, like the early 2000s, you still had remnants of what happened in the 80s. And that was all over the country. You get places like Chicago, Miami. If you yeah. think about yeah. any place where there's a major cities. city, mm -hmm. that's where it affected. And um, from a from a family standpoint, it destroyed families. And, and you know, 
people don't really realize that. And from the police standpoint, it was almost like a, a, a gloves off approach because there was a war on drugs. That's you know? exactly what it was. It led, it was a war, it was on, a war on, drugs. on drugs. Led to that whole broken windows theory. A yeah. lot of that from the crack is what Jay, that's what I'm thinking is that's what happened in the communities and that's what the but theory is. the main is. thing was they were being, kids were being born who right. had nothing to do with it. And they didn't give them a chance at babies. all. They, they start out life with such a, uh, you know, terrible addiction. Or even if they don't have it, their parents are full-blown addicts, right. and it's hard to even escape that life. Yeah. The environment is so key. It's so crucial you, for any, just, anyone. They're, they're just going to fall into that. Yeah, but being born addicted is yeah, that's terrible. hard. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, a, different, it's, it's a different yeah. nature of beast, man. I think that's where they started coming up with a lot of these... Um, these um, deficiencies with these kids, like ADHD and all that other stuff, a lot of that stuff was kind of um, on Probably, the back yeah. end from the crack stuff. Um, but back over to um, to Pete. Uh, so you, now you're, you're raging, you're, you're, you're waging war with the Purple City Gang, right? And um, what happens? What happens after that, right? What I mean? Well, what was happening then was I, I was starting when I was still in uniform. I was starting to get a lot of CIs. And I was okay. getting two or three warrants every two weeks. Okay. And I only had one bad warrant. I probably did, on patrol, in uniform, I probably executed 50 search warrants. And that's when ATF was working with our anti-crime. One of the agents was working with our anti-crime, and I became friends with them. And he was like, you're bringing in more search warrants than everybody, all these, all the crime units in, in, in Manhattan. I got to get you down with me. Yeah. So I ended up getting this warrant where it was against these, a gang called FEB, Fuck Everybody. Okay. And it, I think we got like 10,000 vials several guns, but we found a marble notebook with the whole operation. Oh. Like Heisenberg, well, like Breaking Bad, you know what I mean? Yeah. Kept everything yeah, in there. It was wild. And the guy that couldn't tell we were going after, his name was KK. And, he, and his thing was, you're not taking me alive, I'm not going back. And I was like, I want to I be on that search warrant. <laughs> so, because we had three search warrants going at the same time. Okay. And luckily for us, we caught him when he was taking a crap. Ooh. Because he did have a gun right near the toilet, to toilet bowl. And we were like, if you reach for it, it's a bad way to die, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, all right, you got me. And in his house was a marble notebook, and it had 30 more people in it. And the, it had a Bronx uh, operation and a Long Island one and the one in Manhattan. And that was my ticket down to ATF. And I went down to ATF for almost two years. We ended up arresting, doing a, a huge operation on them where we ended up doing, I don't know, probably about 20 buys. We, we got over well over 100,000 files that we bought. We bought a firearm that did the shooting. You remember the interarms uh, shooting? Yeah. We bought that firearm that did that, and we ended up closing several murder cases on that. Oh, shit. And um, then that, on the downtime, we started investigating the Greek mob. And we... How'd you, get, how'd you guys get into the, the Greek mob situation? I worked with a guy named Haradopoulos, and he was Greek. Yeah. And he arrested this guy named Georgie. And this guy was just a wealth of information, and he was like, listen... They, we first, it first started with, we were buying beepers and fake plates from the auctions. Yeah. And then he introduced us to the main the captain. And I sat down with the captain and then he's like, have you ever tried a bazooka? And I didn't know what that bazooka was. I'm a narcotics cop and I don't know what bazooka is. What is that, a piece of gum? No. <laughs> I swear to God, I swear I said that to myself. Bazooka. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what about, you know, you got a piece of gum for me? He's yeah. like, no, don't be stupid. So he hands me this reversed Coke, a crack that packed the Coke, that purifies the Coke. So I'm like, and he goes, give it a taste. So I put my finger there and did the middle finger like I did it. I said, hey, that's good. 
I go, can you give us, uh, I want $2,000 worth. That night we, we bought $2,000 worth of uh, bazooka. And we ended up buying about $20,000 worth. And we were about to make a huge purchase of uh, heroin with these guys. And he introduced us to this guy that looked like the predator. He was huge and he, was, he worked out in Zen's Gym. Thank God I knew Zen's Gym in Brooklyn because mm -hmm. I worked out there too when I was a teenager. Yeah. So he's like, all right, the, uh, the guy was huge. I mean, and all these <laughs> rubber bands in his beard, in his hair. I'm like, holy shit, this guy looks like the predator. He's going <laughs> to kill us. No vest, no backup. It's just me and this guy, Jimmy. And we were told not to do, the, do it. And we did it anyway. We went there at night with no backup, Ooh, no Kella, nothing. So my back was in, my gun was in my back, I small my back, and I'm like, we're gonna have to kill this guy. This guy, I don't even think a bullet's gonna go through him. Yeah, he was just huge, massive. So he's, and all of a sudden he gets a beep and he lifts up his shirt and he got another gun. He's got a gun wrapped in all rubber bands so you can't get the prints on it. So I start to reach back, and Jimmy looks over to me. He's like, so I pull my hand away. We talk about the deal. He goes, all right, we're going to do the deal in Zin's gym tomorrow. I'm like, tomorrow? How much, how much do you want for the, uh, the, the brick of heroin? You know, he's just like, it's going to cost you 150000 And then he stopped. He goes, you know, you look like a cop. So Jimmy starts... <laughs> He's reaching. I'm like, you know what? You look like a fucking cop. Oh, yeah. So it stopped. So I'm like, all right, so we have to talk to our people and, and we'll, we'll do it. So we went to the, he leaves. We, we go back in our car. We sat in our car <laughs> for like two hours going, that was the scariest human being I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. He was going to kill us. I'm like, we still going to do the deal? And he's like, yeah. I said, all right, I'll do the deal. And the U.S. attorney was just like, you are not doing a deal. That is going to be a setup, and you're going to get killed. Yeah. He's going to have people in there. You go into the, the gym, you're going to get killed. You're not coming out of yeah, it. Yeah, it's going to be a trap. So he just yeah. stopped, and he's like, no. Nah. And that's, that was it. And then we did the trial, and I thought they were trying to get me to stay down there in ATF. They were yeah. trying to get me to be part. I was a part of, I was one of the first cops in hire. Okay. But my job... They didn't want it. I, I was at war with the uh, the PSU patrol uh, stabilizing unit. Okay. They turned it into a na narcotics unit, but he didn't like me. He didn't like it. He didn't like was, that I was getting more warrants than his unit when I was on, on patrol. Mm -hmm. He goes, you know, I know you're doing something dirty. I'm like, what? Because I have a CIs and you guys don't. Yeah. He's well, you, I know you bend the rules. Yeah, I bend rules, but I don't break laws. I bend rules all the time. I'm a I'm a rule bender. Yeah. You know, that's just the way I did my job. Mm -hmm. And they ended up, I was, should have went into his unit, and I should have gotten my, my shield probably within six months because I had done the two years down at ATF. Yeah. I was going to say, you didn't get the shield from being down at ATF? No, they, they squashed and, and I had a really cool captain. He said, just give it three months, I'm, you're going to get your shield. And that's where the nightmare happened. I went back to anti-crime. And How much time did you have on at that point? I had a... Seven years on, I would have been the youngest detective ever in, in housing history. Seven years with ATF, and but you did two years before. So when you first got the ATF, you had about five years on. Yeah. This is great. How are the ATF guys? ATF guys were great. I mean, they they'd call me and say, "We're doing a warrant. You want to come?" And you just report there. They were my bosses. I, I didn't report to anybody but the but the ATF agents. Oh, yeah. So I was getting like 300, 300 hours. Is there a lot of ATF months? work when you were there? No, I, I didn't do any work with ATF. I did the only thing I did with the ATF once. I caught a a bank robber that was wanted in different states. Right. And uh, that, uh, he broke Eli, out of Eli Gorin. Eli Gorin. And what the ATF did oh, after the thing, they wanted to trace the guns to a straw buyer, which like in another state you could just buy the guns and then you sell them to uh, someone from another state. So they wanted to prosecute him on that also because that was a full blown thing. And the ATF just came up and told me about the case and asked me to fly down to uh, uh, Virginia to testify. Oh, okay. 
So I, I was with them for three days just for testifying. Right. That's and the Long Island guy you got on the boardwalk? Yeah, Eli Gorman. Yeah. Can you run us through that real quick, what was going through your head on the boardwalk? Because you, you said you see this predator guy, then you see this, this guy is huge, like on like the mountain, well, you know what I mean? He was a big guy, but he wasn't like, yeah, he, wasn't like scary like Pete's guy. But he was a big guy, and he had a German Shepherd. He, he was wanted for breaking out. He was wanted for bank robberies. He was doing 30 years and broke out of California jail. <laughs> <laughs> a federal jail he broke out. And then he got picked up again. Like Shawshank Redemption over here. Yeah, he, he got picked up again and for guns and robberies, and he broke out of a Pennsylvania prison. What's his trick? Do we know? We don't know. <laughs> right? He, he should have told me. <laughs> <laughs> but he broke out twice, and we, we traced him. And... Uh, we got him with some guns, and we caught him on the boardwalk, me, my partner, and my supervisor. And we caught him outside in New York City. But uh, we never even booked him for the guns in Long Island. We were yeah. after him. Actually, our case started out uh, as a harassment case, yeah, not even wife, a crime. Right? He came into New York and slapped, slapped his wife for his ex-wife because his kid was being bar mitzvah. Yeah. We even went to the bar mitzvah. You know, undercover. Yeah, One family out. thought we were from Everyone the other side. Everyone was wearing a yarmulke. Your yeah. partner was like, what is this? He's like, just put it on. It's just... But uh, the thing was, the ATF prosecuted him down there. They caught the guy who bought the guns. And they offered him immunity to testify against Gorin. And they wanted me to testify that I'm the one who caught him with the guns. So they, that was my only interaction with them. Otherwise, it was me and my partner on everything alone. You know, basically. I'm just picturing, imagine them together. Oh my God. <laughs> you, know, you know, I know, I know. I'm just the old guy. I'm the dinosaur. <laughs> you know, I wish I could have worked with Ralph. That would have been great. So, so now we go back to. So they send you back to anti crime when you get out of this ATF uh, task force, yeah. right? So walk us through that because you said that's when the, the nightmare uh, began. So I want you to kind of walk us through it. What year? That was in ninety-three. Damn, bro. Ninety-three. <laughs> I was one years old. Yeah, he got me. <laughs> look, at Pete, look at Pete's face. He's around. like, what? Because you're tired of... Yeah, you're about to write a doodle yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. That baby food. I still eat baby food today. <laughs> back then, so when I went back, I had known so many locations of things that were going on. Yeah. So one night, the boss says, all right, who's catching? I didn't want to make a collar. I had something to do with my kids, and my partner didn't want to make a collar. But one of the girls, a girl wanted to make a collar and, and I said, well, if you want to go, we can go up to the Heights. I'll be the undercover and uh, make a drug collar. Let me tell you, before you get into this, I've noticed that most people get into shit the night they don't want to get into shit. Oh, yeah. It, it always happens. I talked to, I can't tell you how many cops have said, I don't want to make a collar this night. My partner didn't want to make a collar. I got something Someone going was on. looking and then this happened. Oh, yeah. So he's got my, like, I got goosebumps because I want to hear what this is. Where's it going? The heights were popping then, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, heights, it was all no. People don't realize. It was just a 3 4 then? I was in the 3 0. Oh. Okay. There was no 3 3. That, okay. All no, right. the 3 0, oh, that was later. I just got in trouble. Dirty so, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I got my 164th in Amsterdam, and I got a one of those fishing hats, but it was the Oakland Raiders. Okay. I have long hair. <laughs> You know, my beard and... We all had hair once. <laughs> I don't know where it went. <laughs> so I go to my partners, I right, listen, you got to ghost me. And they're like, well, what is that? I'm like, oh, I'm oh fucking... God. And I'm going, I'm fucked. It's a girl in, in my partner. I said, you got to stay a half a block or a block away. Just watch where I go. Yeah, don't go in. Do not come into the building. So I'm walking down the street and, you know, all these guys are going, what do you want? What do you want? So I, I decided to go down to the corner. He says, what are you looking for? I said, uh, give me, I, I want some white, some, some white snow. He said, all right, come with me. Now he brings me into the building. And he go, we go up to the first floor. And it's the first apartment. There's two guys sitting on the stairwell. Well, the, I guess the, uh, the landing. So I look at them and they look and he puts the key in the, into the door. He turns around and goes, you know, you look like a cop. I said, listen, we're either going to do this or I'll go down to the Colombians and get, get my shit there. All right, you're cool, Poppy. So he opens up the door and I hear two voices coming into the building. It's my partners. Ghosts. Oh, man. And you not in uniform. No, we're on right. plane. Well, right, right, right. So I, I look at him and I'm like, what the fuck are you guys doing here? <laughs> so he goes, you guys looking? 
to buy. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're shit in their pants. So he and the two other guys sitting, they're buyers, supposedly. So now I have five people in there in total. So it's a railroad apartment, and the back of the apartment is that leads to the street mm -hmm. where you can see the actual street from the living room. Okay. He sits at the in the, the kitchen on the right, and there's a big spool where the, the old telephone company, not the old, the, the telephone company put their, their wires on. Mm -hmm. That's the desk, that's, a, that's the table he sits at. And there's a door, a loose door against the window. So he reach, reaches behind there. I'm like, okay, if he draws, I'm going to have to draw on him. He, just, he pulls out the cokey, and now he has a scale. He goes, what do you want? I said, let me have an eight ball. So once you put the coke on there, I pull my shield out, I said, and I kick the, I kick the the table into him and pin him against the wall. And I said, if you move, I'm gonna blow you away. He doesn't understand anything I'm saying. Yeah. So I tell the girl who is Spanish, tell him he's under arrest. Pull your shields out. Let them know we're the police. He's screaming in Spanish that we're doing a rip on him. Uh. I'm like, what is he saying, Sharon? He's saying we're doing a rep. I'm like, show him your shield. So now I grab the two guys that we're going to buy. I got to get everybody out of the apartment because now I know there's going to be a problem. I bring the one guy in the back. The, the window in the back opens and it leads to a fire escape where they can go down. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm here to buy. I'm trying to get more intel. I go, do you know any spots? No, no, no. I said, right, get the fuck out of here. As I let him go, I hear banging on the front door. And it's a group of guys. And I know it's his crew because they were out front. And they're, and they're screaming, let us in, in in Spanish. And I'm watching the door move. I tell my partner, pull your gun out, get in front. They're coming, they're going to fucking kill us. They're coming to kill us. I said, you better shut to the girl. I said, shut him up. Because he's yelling, they're doing a rip. And I'm like, holy shit. I grab the second guy. He's got, a, he's got two bulges in his pocket. So I put my gun out. I said, empty your pockets. He throws a gravity knife and money. Ask him what he's doing. He, get, he actually gives me a spot. I can go and make more arrests. In my mind, I'm thinking, let's just keep making arrests. Which was stupid. I cut him loose. He doesn't, I said, all right, take your shit and get out of here. He just runs, right to, runs out the, uh, right to the, through the, door, the window and goes down. I grab his shit, I put it in my, my, uh, my vest, inside my pant, my, uh, my shirt. I said, I'll voucher it as found property. I hear, these guys leave the front door now, and I hear three shots go off oh. right under me. They think it's us escaping. They shoot the guy. They shoot the second guy. So I bring the, the dealer. I said, I use him as, shield, as a shield because we are going to get into a shootout now. The street is loaded with people now. It's, it's got like 100 people on there. They're all pointing. And I could see the guy running that did the shooting. In my stupid ass mind, I'm thinking, all right, I'll chase him. I'll get my combat cross that they, that they owe me. <laughs> yeah. I chase him down. Can't catch him. I go back to the scene now. My boss is on the uh, scene. There's cop cars all over the place. He's like, what happened? I said, we did the buy. This guy's under arrest. And I hear a guy moaning <laughs> on the side of the building. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm like, what's the matter with you? He's like, my stomach hurts. And he pulls his hands out. He's his stomach is blown away. Shit. So now I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to get my shield. I'm going to be held responsible because I let him go. I'm, I panicked. So we go back. He gets, he goes to the hospital. We go back to the, the house. And I'm like, all right, we vouch you the money. I have $1,700 on the floor, the gun. That's found property. Vouch you the, the drugs. They didn't take the drugs. The girl didn't take the drugs or the scale. I go, we have nothing. So the girl goes, well, I don't, I don't want the collar. I said, it's your collar. I'm a, I said, I'll help you with it, but it's your collar. 
You still have the sale. He tried to, he tried to sell to us. So we process, we, we process the guy. I, I do the guy's uh, fingerprints and I do the voucher. I mark it found the $1,700 I put down is found property. So the guy can, if the guy comes in, he can get it back. A boss pulls her to the side, makes her mock the, the boss didn't like me. He's a Spanish boss. I, always, I was always clashing with him. He makes her mock the voucher, arrest property. Evidence. Evidence, yeah. So I'm very good friends with the duty captain that was on. And he says, he comes, he goes, listen, get your books up. Is there anything I need to know about it? And I'm thinking, I'm not going to give him the whole all the details, I don't want to throw him into the fire with me. There's no way I'm doing this. I'm not bringing him down. He, he's done the right thing for me. So I said, listen, this is pretty much what we, ha what we have. He said, all right, just keep your books up and you're going to be all right. I'm going to go down to the 3-4 because now they have the guy in the 3-4, not the 3-up. Okay. He, Captain Lennox gets down there and he pretty much has the whole thing squashed where nothing's going to happen. Internal Affairs goes, goes right to the 3-4. This guy, Lieutenant Burwell, yells, you're, you, you're off the case to, to the captain. And captain, he, he, yeah, okay, right. He keeps talking to the detectives. He's like, did you fucking hear me? I said, you're off the case. He says, excuse me for a second. He turns around and goes, let me have your shield and gun. You're suspended for insubordination. The lieutenant runs out of the building, goes on the phone, calls the deputy inspector of IAB and says, he won't let me uh, investigate this. Put him on. These guys used to patrol as cops. Okay. He says, listen, Al, you, 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 you can, you're going to suspend him, but you're going to let him do the investigation. No, I'm not. He's getting suspended. He's not doing the investigation. He goes, Al, you know what? You're suspended. <laughs> So Lennox says, listen, you pot smoking bastard. <laughs> you want to suspend me, you have to do it in front. You have to do it in person. You can't do it over the phone. Hold up, Al. All right, take it easy. Take it easy. All right. Suspend them, but do two reports. He's going to ditch the reports. He does an extra one. Al, Al does an extra report and he keeps it on the side because yeah. he knew Something was going to happen. Yeah. Now, this is the beginning of the Marlin Commission. Uh, Mul that, yeah, the Marlin Commission. So, he knows sooner or later this is going to be brought up. I end up not getting jammed up at that time. They break me down back to patrol. Oh. And he comes in, he says, listen, it's going to be a while before you get go back into plain clothes and get your shield. And now I'm fuming. But a year later, I still keep, I'm still making collars. A year later, uh, one of the narcotic uh, DAs say, listen, we should get a drink after. I got to talk to you. I'm like, all right, this is not good. Uh, he goes, your name's coming up in the special prosecution office. They're going to they're gonna indict you. And I knew what it was for. That, yeah. So they... They did indict me, and they, uh, my bail was $100,000. They had me for armed robbery, larceny, two counts, and official misconduct. What were the two counts of larceny for? For the money. For the money. Because the, the, the sergeant made her change it. Yeah. Oh. So it was a document of the, the uh, government record, yeah. right? And the voucher and the memo book entries. So I ended up saying, oh, that I'm, there's no way I'm doing this. I'm going to take it to trial. They, they, they owe me, in my mind, I'm still saying they owe me a fucking shield. Right. So a year later, I end up getting booked and I, I take it to trial. The PBA lawyer at the time says, listen, this is uh, too high profile for us. We're not, we can't represent you. Now, I'm oh. still a delegate. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're not going to fucking represent me. Yeah. This is why I, I pay my dues law. It's like, no, we can't represent you. 
they end up representing the girl and, the, and my partner. I was going to ask where the girl was. What happened to her? They wound up testifying against him. Oh, shit. So. Save some for the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is only like a chap. So if, if she, if she would have took that scale, and and what if she took the scale said? and the drugs, it would have been a lot better. See, but the bosses didn't like him to begin with because yeah. of all the arrests he was making off the uh, housing project property. Just so mind, mind, just people. mind blowing. Like literally, city just turned your back on you there's and said, "Pete, people sorry, just man." Didn't like him, and you know how that is with the job. When it's bosses that don't like you, if they feel like you get their foot in the door to jam you up, their foot's there. Yeah. You know, so, you're getting one of the baddest dudes off the street there. And I, I actually ran into my captain when I was writing the book. I called him. I found his number and I said, Al, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you as a person in the book, but I changed the name. Because I, he, he just had traumatic brain damage. He fell in at his head. Yeah. He said, Pete, keep my name in there. I don't care what you do. Call me Lennox, call me Larry. I don't care. Great guy. I, I went to his house about a week later and he, and he said, listen, he actually, he, he got suspended for writing a letter for me to the judge. He got 30 days without pay. And so did another, so did another lieutenant. They got 30 days suspension without pay because it was a huge, huge uh, article on, on it. And the lieutenant wrote, he retired because of it. He said, I can't sit here in purgatory knowing this cop's getting locked up for this. This, is my, this will be my retirement. The, the lieutenant said Officer Thron was by far the best collar cop I've ever encountered. And the judge had it in for him, and he, he convicted a, an innocent man. It, it, the, the trial was just a, a nightmare, but I, I'll take all your time over this, you know. So you ended up doing two years. About a little less than We really, years. I wanted to hit, we didn't really hit on the family life then. You were married, you said you had two kids? I was, she was my common law, I had three kids. Actually two kids at the time, I ended up having a third when I went in. Was there ever a point when you were going through, even before that happened, saying, do I ever want to step away from this? Did that ever cross your mind? With all the back and forth that you've been going through saying, not getting the support at work, is it even, you know, I can no. do something else? Never I, I ran just, through your head? I just, I loved being a cop and I loved making arrests. I loved, you know, I, I was an action junkie. That, that's, that's what it comes down to. I, I love the action. Uh, most, most active right. guys are adrenaline junkies. That adrenaline, yeah, that yeah, hypervigilance. And it's hard to, we talk about a lot in rough responders, it's hard to be on that 10 all the time, get home and... You know, we try to do it slowly to get to a two or three, but then it just drops. And that's like a depressive state where guys don't even want to get out of that nine or ten because right. of what can happen. Well, I would imagine that Pete's mind was uh, messed up because he's yeah. feeling he's doing the right job. And he can't believe that it's turning against him. You know, it's like being a, I would equivalent it to like you being a healthy working out guy and everything. And all of a sudden you get like cancer. Your body's like turning against you. You know, and he, this it's is it's hard to accept. Mm -hmm. You know, when you take care of your body and you get a sickness, you feel like you're being betrayed by yourself. Yeah. And he's being betrayed by uh, these bosses that didn't like him. It must be, it, you know, it must really mess with your mind. You yeah, it did. It did. Tough times never last, tough people do. This is a perfect example of both of you guys. I mean, that's yeah. right there. A lot of cops. I'm like blown yeah. away. I'm like listening to the story. It's like, yeah, well, you, I mean, but I think Pete got you each a book, too. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. thank I'm you. Gonna, I'm being a truck tonight. I'm no, but I mean, you want to talk about resiliency. We talk about a lot of people say resiliency, resiliency, this, this, that. I mean, look, you went through hell, and now you're writing books, and just talking about this is definitely you, help, a lot a of co help a lot of cops, a lot of people in general. And that's, I, I hope. When I, when I was in, at, at the, like my first, uh, first day that I went in for my, my full bid, crazy huh? cops saying a bid yeah. you know it's just insane <laughs> I was in with another cop from upstate and became really good friends with him and he was a really good writer and I said you know Mac I think I should write a book and I think the cover will be a judge's mallet breaking my shield which it is and sorry you guys can get a little visual of that oh my god man Pete designed these covers himself let me ask a question right 
So they tell you you're going in, right? <laughs> you got to mentally prepare for that. So now, what What the fuck was going through your mind when you walking into this prison? I'll tell you what happened. Because <laughs> I, I, I got to know where your brain was walking into uh, this place. First of all, anybody telling you that they're not scared is full crap. Yeah, I'm, I'm scared, scared shitless. Mm -hmm. I don't know who I'm going to encounter. I know... Put away good, a pretty good chance some someone's going to be in there. To be. You put away a lot of people. This was, I went to Rikers first, and then I went to uh, Oneidas. So in Rikers, after I after the trial, and I got sentenced, I went right to Rikers. So your dad, you're sitting on Rikers. What building? You remember? Uh, PC. So you ran on the boat, right? That... No, no, no. I was in. I was. It was on the island. On, on the island, right there. And they had me in my own cell first. And I know this is the judge. He. This judge fucking hated me. He had me put into a dorm. So now I'm, they're walking me up to the dorm. I'm going, what are you doing? To the correctional officer. And I said, I'm going to get fucking killed in there. There's, there's 60 guys in the dorm. Because you can't, don't worry, everything's going to be right. I go up to the fucking... Easy for him to say. Yeah, I go up to the door, the, the cell, and there's, there's gates there. Probably about 15 guys, 10, 15 guys, they go right to the gate. And they're holding the newspaper with me on it. So I'm like, fuck. Now I'm, I'm, now I'm getting pissed off. My eyes are starting to water. And that's how I know I'm really pissed when my eyes water. So I'm like, you can't put me in there. They're going to fucking kill me. It's like, you can't show me you're scared. I said, wouldn't you be fucking scared? They got my picture over there. What are you talking about? So I'm like, I'm not going in. He goes, you're going in. I fucking shoved the, shoved the correction officer. I said, here, shove them down, push them down. I said, charge me with another, another arrest me. Charge me with another charge. Put me in a hole. He's like, I'm not doing that. So now, and they're all screaming shit. Something at that moment, I, don't, I can't even explain what it is, changed me. I said, okay, no problem. I went to the front. I said, listen, you, some of you motherfuckers, you're going to get me but I'm going to take some of you with me. Mm -hmm. The door opened. There was a, this other guy named Con, Country Black Guy, nice guy, big dude. He says, any of you motherfuckers touch him, I'm going to kill him. Kill him. You're, you're going to answer to me. So they parted. So I go up to him, I go, listen. <laughs> I said, I ain't giving you my fucking shoes. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I don't want your shoes. I, I it was pretty ballsy what you did. I was in there for about 20 days. Mm -hmm. I ended up becoming good friends with him and the president of the Nietas. Really? And uh, how'd that come about? Because Nietas, there. He's pretty, pretty bad pretty dude. Legit. He yeah. he was a bad dude, but I mean, they were bad when I was coming up. I don't know what's going on now, but when I was coming. And up, they ran the they run the jails. Yeah. They run the jails, no doubt about it. And. He kept seeing me look at my kid's picture, and I was reading, and he's like, this guy doesn't belong here. You know, you, you can tell who belongs there, who doesn't belong there. Yeah. So we started talking, became friends, and I got bailed out. I, I went on bail, and I, was gonna, I, I did my appeal. But before, when they, when they released me the night before, he says, listen, first of all, the guy country is only 18 years old. He, him and the, and the Spanish guy, they run the dorm. So they're, they're, they're friends. They have, they have the Spanish guys and the white guys under control, and country has the black guys under control. So nothing happens. If something happens, they, they answer to those guys. So the guy country goes, listen, man, you, you've been like a father to me. Would you, can you adopt me? Like, out of nowhere. I swear to God. So I'm like, ah, man, I, you know, I'm honored, but... I got my own kids. I got, I got kids, and you know, I'm, I got to still do my my sentence. He get, we exchange our numbers. Now I go talking to the guy and then the other guy. He says, "Listen, a guy's coming in here. I need you to stay in your bunk. Don't get up." I'm like, well, he goes, "He's a he's a pedophile, yeah. oh, gonna and we're going to deal with him." So, and he says, I want you to know something. I put it out there to the, to the other guys. You know, I, I don't know how they really communicate, but he did. 
He said, we want you to be an honorary member. Of the Nyekas? Yeah. Oh, shit. Okay. So I'm like, you know, I'd love to do that, but <laughs> I really can't do it. You know, I came in here alone. I want to get out of here alone. He goes, no, I respect it, but we got your back. I'm not, you know, I said, okay, but I'm not going to be putting the, the rosaries on and yeah, the white yeah. shirts. I, I can't do it. He's like, I know, I, I respect that. He said, but can you do me a favor? Is there any way you can check on my, my daughter? She's in the hospital. And her eardrum broke. I actually sent somebody there to check on her and take care, you know, make sure she was all right. And the guy never forgot it. And when I went through to these other prisons, I'd see these Spanish guys going, so-and-so sends his regards, we got you. This is a movie. This is a full-blown movie. You can yeah, why? Yeah, I don't know why well, this is not a movie. The book tells it real right. good. He writes great people, and it really tells it good in these books. And uh, So not a lot of altercations with you in there at all? I had Here altercations in... when I went to my main my main place, pretty much at the end. I, I ended up getting stabbed <laughs> with a uh, guy sharpened a toothbrush. Okay. And, and uh, it was during a football game. I was going. I was getting ready to go home. And he hit me. What I, uh? What prisons did they bounce you around to? I went to uh, upstate, which was the uh, it's like the transit part. Then I went to downstate. I actually went to downstate first, and then I went to oh man, begins with a U. Can't even remember it. There for a few days. That's the first time I was ever called a convict by a cop. I was, by a con, by a correctional officer. I was just like. Shit, I'm in trouble. I, I'm, they put me in this little cell. My freaking mattress was this thin, no blanket, and it was like 10 degrees. And I'm watching my breath go out. I'm like, fuck. I'm gonna die in here, you know? Mm. He's like, get up, convict. I'm like, holy crap, really? Don't you, did you read my jacket? I was like, calm. <laughs> <laughs> and then I ended up going to a night of fur almost about a year and a half and that's about seven eight hours away oh he was up there yeah these books i can i'm just i say you weren't really much of a big writer before this were you no 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 this is his first book this just shows book. how if something really means something to you you know and you really put your mind and heart into it you yeah. really can make something come to life and something like this is not easy i actually wasn't going to do this book Speaking to Ralph, he had said, Pete, you didn't touch on your prison time enough in your first book. And a few other people said, you got to talk about it. Because mm -hmm. I was going to do a second book about more of my cop stories. Yeah. This was probably harder because I'm, I'm not proud of it. So you think psychologically you weren't ready to talk about it as much in that book, the first um, book? No, I, I think I was, but I didn't want to because it's like this. I'm proud. I was proud to be a cop. Proud of the cop I was. Mm. This, it was like I'm telling people, yeah, I was a, almost like a perp. And, but it came out, you know, it came out good. And I think Ralph, because it, I don't think I would have done it without him pushing me to, he said, you need, you need to talk about it. Thank God for Ralph, man. Yeah. I mean, it's a good book. It describes it good. Yeah, man. I, I mean, I, I, I can't even imagine, dude, just to be on, you're on one side and now you're on the opposite side. Yeah. And, um, you know. I really meant fuck with your head. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, they, you know, they speak about ebbs and flows in life, right? It's yeah. Super Ups highs and, and super lows. So to be somewhere where like, you know, you put a lot of guys away and now you're sitting in the same situation um, as these guys, you know, just coming from the cop side. The mentality that you must have had, I mean, you got to be a mentally strong guy to do what you did. And um, I became mentally strong. You became mentally strong. I, I, you have no I choice. I was already physically strong. Yeah. And I, when I was in, I was doing 1,000 push-ups every day, 300 pull-ups, 1,000 sit-ups, and, and walking out with weights. Yeah. The mental part was, I'd say the first six months, there, every day I thought, I thought about killing myself because I just didn't know if I... First of all, I never knew if, if something was going to happen. happen. Yeah. I, I, I talk about sleeping with my eye, one eye open. And that's pretty much what I did. I mean, I really didn't get sleep. And 
I just, I was waiting for it to happen. When I sat at a table, I would always stay like this in case somebody was going to come and slice Especially me. Especially face, yeah, shit. And it, that, it was just in my mind, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not going home with a present. And that's what they do when they find out you are going to get paroled, they want to send you home with a gift. Yeah. Because they're not going home. And they're pissed off. Yeah. You got buck 50 sent you home with a gift. Yeah. I mean, kudos to you, man. I, I don't think a lot of people could do what you have done. Um, I appreciate that. That, that mental resiliency is, is something that I think, um, like you said, you became mentally strong. I think it was in you. But it you was had to in be put me. It brought in a situation. It, yeah. it brought it out. And then it, it's, it's horrible to say, but I became them. I hear you. And I always tried to keep in the back of my mind, I'm still a cop. I, I still feel like a cop because, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I, I love you guys. Yeah. And that's what separated me. That's what kept me separated. But I was that, you know, and there were times where guys would say, you know. Yeah, be them on the outside. Yeah. And you're yeah. a cop on the inside. Exactly. Yeah. And they'd say, you know, you're still a cop. I'm like, no, I'm in here with you. I'm, I'm a fucking convict, just like you guys are. But in, in the back of my mind, I'm like... Any time in the street, I'd have you in cuffs, you know, and that, that, that's what's going through my mind, but I don't wish that on anybody. No, on anybody, especially cops. Prison yeah. is yeah. just, it changes you. Oh, it, it definitely does. does. It changes you. I know I have plenty of friends I grew up with that have went that route, and, you know, some come home, and they never go back, and some just, it's a revolving door. Um, some people learn, some people don't, and some people, you know, get they, it. They get their meals there. Yeah. And they have a bed that, that's, right. some of them hone their, their skills there because they gravitate to people that are experts at what they do. Yeah. And they learn how to do what they got More caught for better. Rules. Yeah, somebody once told me that. Um, as a family member told me, he's like, uh, um, some people allocate their energies to the wrong things. Absolutely. And a lot of criminals are geniuses. They just put it into the wrong. wrong. I, I, yeah. I wrote about that. These... These guys could be helping the world, yeah. and but they just allocated their energy to the world. Or running a company, yeah, yeah. It's just they're running insane. criminal enterprises. Right. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, damn, bro. Uh, well, I mean, I'm kind of blown away by this story. I'm very excited to uh, start reading these books, man. Um, I've recently just started reading books, like oh, I crush books in like a week. <laughs> and um, it's just something I never I never was a really big reader and then all of a sudden I just started getting into books well, you're, reading, you're picking up subjects you like yeah, you find yeah. Really interesting. I have a for you especially when it's real life stuff yeah and police work which you are it's going to resonate more stuff. with me because I sat down and spoke with you right so now when I'm right. reading the book I can actually picture your face that's right. the whole thing yeah. and all these things so I'm, I'm, I'm blessed you to be sitting here you met the man behind the pages yeah. I'm blessed to be yeah, sitting here and uh, I'm having I'm this conversation to be on the show. I, I really am um, I think I'm going to pull a lot from this book um, hopefully our listeners will, will get a lot from the book as well um, Frank you got anything you want to add because I know we're, we're getting close to ending the show here so I just want to thank you Pete you know seriously thank, thank you, you for, 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 having for, me. for being yeah, for being thank Sergeant you, Oh, and Ralph, you know, thank, you. Me Ralph to always, thank you. Ralph, thank you. I uh, really appreciate you. Hey, I appreciate uh, being on your show. You do, guys do a great uh, service to the police in, rep, in reps for responders and inside the labyrinth. Thanks for filming at my home here. I'm very proud of my office. Glad you showcased it a little. <laughs> my friend Billy Butterfield <laughs> built this place for me. It's a great spot. Uh, did it all by himself. It's a lot of work we put in here. And I'm happy that you came up here to do it. Thank you, Ralph. Was... And you guys do a lot for the police. It's uh, great to let us be involved in it, too. Yeah, I appreciate it. It was an honor. Um, yeah, Peter, I was just saying thanks for being so honest and a prime example of n not giving up, you know what I mean? Because when there's either a difference between when you give up, it can go that other route, kind of mm -hmm. what you talked about. And I've been yeah. there. And not that I've been in jail, but when I went to the hospital for about six weeks in the farm here i am thinking you know you send edps and things like that to the hospital and you start feeling that way of right you know wow am i going to be able to get out of this well, Pete's but through the it. grace he's of god you know you got right. out i was able to you know have to go through what you went through but still mentally that was a in my head i'll never i didn't want to hand my gun and shield in because i didn't want to care what people thought about me now i hand it in i said i'll never be a fucking cop ever but I still am through the grace of God, yeah. and to, but you got it's an everyday battle of doing the right thing. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So I just really, that's, you know, just thanks for sharing what you said today. No, thank you very much for having me. So right, I'm asking the personal questions quick. Yeah. Rapid yeah. fire. All right. All right. You ready? Okay. <laughs> just, we asked you, we asked you some questions. We asked you some questions to let, to get, let the listeners get to know you a little bit better. If you had one meal to eat every single day for the rest of your life and you don't have to worry about, you know, all the nutrition facts and, and everything happening in your body, what would you eat every day? Same meal. Probably pizza. <laughs> what kind? Can't go wrong with pizza. Um, pepperoni, that's about it. Oh. Mm. Right, it was easy. Yeah, yeah Pete is a simple guy. <laughs> Favorite movie that comes to the top of your head? One or two? One or two French movies. French Connection, The Seven Ups. Okay. Oh, he, Haven't got no that yet. Yeah, no, yeah, no hesitation. That's the first. Workout movements, workout guy. One barbell movement and then one other um, accessory to superset with that. But it's only, you can only do it every single day. You're not going to be able to do anything else. What would you choose? A bench and, and flies. With the um, dumbbells, dumbbells or cable? Dumbbells. Okay. Hey, okay. All right. Chest and tries all day, baby. <laughs> one person to hang bench out with. Show. Dead, wow. dead, or, <laughs> dead, dead, or, dead or alive to have, let's say we were going to do a show next month, you would want them here. Dead or alive, who would you want to be, be, be on the table with? That's a good question, man. Uh, Ralph first, and then... Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting in there. <laughs> <laughs> good answer, Pete. <laughs> Maybe Popeye. Popeye Doyle. Okay, yeah. All right, cool. I like that. Yeah. That's the first That's too. the first one, too. We go in the back, we, me and Ralph and Jason, we've been working on this for months. We had lift up a tarp. I said, Pete, got a fucking time machine. You can go anywhere in the future or in the past. Where are you going and why? It could be 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it could be 200 years ago. Easy one. Right back in that apartment. Oh, shit. And what would... Wow. Man. And I want to bring up, you know, I, I say I don't believe in regrets. I believe in learning experiences in life. That's how we learn and grow. What's the one thing you would have, that you would have done differently? Great or question. not differently, but what's one thing you kind of said? I would, I probably wouldn't have went in the, the apartment. For other cops to listen, what would you tell them in that situation? I wouldn't have went back in the, I wouldn't have went into that apartment. Period. I wouldn't have went on that street, and it would have concentrated on the projects. So it would have been a true project guy. Yeah. Shit, man. That's, that's, that's powerful, see. bro. I, I think there's no sometimes when you get so wrapped yeah. up as a cop in that shield and that detective or that sergeant route you lose a little bit of yourself and that's the, that's the hardest part of if the shit goes down and time flies by and everything is for the job and it's it's not easy to set I, those I boundaries was dark, I was dark then when I was a cop I was that was my dark side we all have it everyone has it dark and light side everybody and we're hoping that, you know, we always say if we can get one person just to change their mind or, you know, help them in life, that's what it's all about here. So Amen. on that note, episode episode one, season six is in the books. Uh, the last episode we did with Ralph was season five, episode five, if you guys missed that cruising. out. We're cruising. But again, my name is Frank. You can find me at reps underscore four underscore responders. We have Inside the Labyrinth. Um, on Instagram, we also will have this on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. And I'm going to kick it over to my man, Jason. Yeah, you can find me on uh, Instagram, uh, the Real Jumpman J. Uh, that's where you can find me. Also, feature on the podcast with uh, my boy Frankie here. Um, Ralph, where can they find you? Um, uh, website is BronxStreetWarrior.com. I'm on YouTube also. And uh, Amazon has the book and the TV show. There you go. Pete? I'm on Amazon and uh, on Facebook. You can just look oh, up I'm on Pete Facebook on. also. All right, guys. Well, thank you. We appreciate you guys. And uh, see you guys on the next episode. Have a good one.